what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite you to ask some difficult questions. You know, Father Leo talked about how boring, the definition of boring is when we ask questions that nobody else is asking. But my hope is that I'm asking questions that we are all asking. And I think Bishop is still, I think he's out there, but I, I want you to recall during a homily when Bishop asked this question about the parables. And maybe I should wait until he gets here so I can share this with him. But the idea with the parables is that why did Jesus speak to us in parables? And I think that's fitting for not just our reading, but how I want to like to begin my talk because my talk begins with a parable. But as he was asking the question during the homily, I wrote this down because I wanted to share this with you. So the Holy Spirit was kind of convicting me to, to kind of mention another insight. And the insight is, why did Jesus speak to us in parables? Right? That's the question that Bishop asked. And the Lord says, And when he was alone, those present along with the twelve questioned him about the parables. He answered them, The mystery of the kingdom of God has been granted to you, but to those outside everything comes in parables, so that they may look and see but not perceive. And hear and listen, but do not understand, in order that they may not be converted and be forgiven. That's almost mysterious, right? He's trying to explain the parable, but that in itself is mysterious. But I believe what it means is that with the parable, we have an opportunity to go on a journey. Sometimes when we look at a parable, we may not understand what the parable means, but as soon as we grasp the parable, then we move on from maybe not believing to believing. Maybe from not doing to doing. So we go on a journey. That being said, I want to start by talking about how Jesus looks at the kingdom. How he feels about the kingdom. And in Matthew we read, I'm going to have to look this way because I don't have it in front of me right now, but the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field which a person finds and hides again and out of joy goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. I want to highlight that, just that one word there, treasure. The kingdom of God is like a treasure. Right? That's how the Lord sees his kingdom. And we are the people of the kingdom. As a reminder that the kerygma is about good news. The, the treasure, the kingdom, is a treasure. We are a treasure. But how often do we see ourselves that way? Or how often do we see our kingdom, God's kingdom, that way? Right? Father Leah talked about, sometimes he, you know how he kind of views parishioners, right? And I was thinking about this parable because it's like, do we see our parishes as a treasure? And it's hard and it can be challenging mostly because we know that we've been impacted by the world. We know COVID had a major impact on us. But not just COVID. It kind of reminds me of a friend of mine who is a Jewish rabbi. And one day I just felt compelled to ask him, just up front, I asked him, why don't, why don't you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? And he said, well, Armando, as a Jew, when we talk about the Messiah, we believe that the Messiah will bring on the Messianic era, an era full of peace and of joy, of justice. And he said, look around. And I thought, wow, that could be a little challenging, right? As a Catholic, I could have responded, but the truth is, how do we respond to the dilemma that we find ourselves today? But I would say that John, or excuse me, this rabbi, wasn't the only one who's asked this question. Another person that we know well asked this question as well. 
And I'd like to paint a picture. You guys are all familiar with John the Baptist, right? We know that John the Baptist, from his birth, he was called to be a prophet. And he was sent out to the desert to proclaim the coming of the kingdom. He wore camel's hair, ate locusts and honey, right? And he was very fiery. And he spent all his life preparing the way of the Lord, that, that soul voice in the desert. So you can imagine as John devoting his whole life to this, and he sees the Lord, and he was told, whomever you see the Spirit of God come and fall upon, he is the one. He was the one that's going to be baptizing with the Holy Spirit and fire. So I'm sure John is getting excited. His preparation has come to an end, and here is the Lord. But as the story goes, John ends up in prison. And you can imagine what was going on through John's head. And it says, John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Do we sometimes ask ourselves that question? Most of us who've been committed and who've been leaders in the parishes and doing ministry for a while, or perhaps new, we have an expectation, a hope, but sometimes thing, th things don't go as we think they will go. And we may have that doubt sometimes. The good news is that Jesus did respond to John, but I won't say it right now. I'll wait a little bit to come back to that. So as we know, people have begun to make their way back, slowly but surely. And we know that COVID was not a funny or a humorous matter. It was very serious. There's a lot of people who lost their lives. But with COVID, it kind of impacted the way we understood church. Everything that we knew of the culture, particularly the Catholic culture, was shaken to some degree. But it wasn't just COVID that had an impact on us and in our church. Even prior to COVID, there was other impacts. Now, I'm going to list a couple of more technical terms, right? So I hope it's not a um, little heady. But, <laughs> yes, boring. <laughs> but we're familiar with these, okay? Secularism. Intentional separation of civil matters from religious affairs. Rationalism. So reliance on the power of reason influenced by secularism as the only form of knowledge. And relativism. Reason, or excuse me, knowledge, truth, and morality are all relative and are not absolute. So we know that these have been impacting our world and in our church for a while. And I share this because the people that we are trying to reach, right, those folks that we're trying to either come, um, have them come back or come back for the first time, have all been influenced by this. And I can testify to that because that's where I was. So in reality, the people that you're trying to learn how to reach out to is me. So how do you reach out to me? How did the Lord reach out to me? See, when I was young, I grew up, or I was born in Nicaragua, and we left Nicaragua um, because of a war. There was the Sandinistas versus the Contras, and my parents eventually made their way to Florida. And in Florida, we were around the Catholic faith, but Nicaragua was, it was part of the culture. So to, to some degree, I began to experience going to public school and um, being around the society, the influence of all these things. So how do you reach out to me? First, I want to say that with these influences, you also have a person, the people that we're communicating with, they're impacted and they're resisting, right? They're, they're, they're kind of resisting in all kinds of ways. We know that body, mind, and soul could be affected. Now, all this really leads to, I'm going to just summarize it in these two ways. One, 
wrong teaching. I had a technical term here, um, unorthodoxy, but I figured out simplify it. Wrong teaching, right? It also leads to wrong practice. For me, the wrong teaching led to, I was agnostic. So I thought I was kind of being smart by saying, okay, well, I can't prove that God exists, but I can't also prove that God doesn't exist. Right? So I became agnostic. I became secular. I wanted to devoid myself of what I thought was superstitious. Now, if you're not familiar with the Hispanic culture, especially Catholic culture, sometimes it can be superstitious. But to me, that's how I associated the faith. So I saw the faith as superstitious, so I was very rational. But I also refused to get involved with the church. I had loathing. There's no way I want to go and do this or that. Now, I'm a little extreme, I would say that, but other people are there as well, right? So what do you do? How do you reach out to me? Now, I want to say that Jesus is not naive to at least people like myself back then, right? He spent a lot of time around us. There's a, there's a time where he says, while he was in Jerusalem, in, um, for the Feast of Passover, many began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew them well and did not need anyone to testify about human nature since he himself knew it well. Right, so what, do, what does that mean? So it means that the Lord knows, right? He's aware. So how do you respond? So I wanna say that the Lord begins to win us over by building a relationship with us. Now, remember that quote from John? Like, go, go ask, are you the one? Well, Jesus responds to that. But first, I want to start here. From 1 John. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son for our expiation of sins. God takes the first step. You know, we're always trying to be creative and trying to ask those questions about how do we do this, right? How do we do this? But God has already taken that first step. Now, do you guys remember maybe a couple of weeks ago, um, if you weren't watching um, the NFL, there was an incident where DeMar Hamlin ends up being hit, ends up in the middle of the field. And for a brief moment, his heart stopped. And we know that that had a huge impact on everyone watching. But I want to share with you a little bit of the impact it had on the quarterback, Josh Allen. Because this is a beginning, it begins to illustrate how God begins to develop that relationship with us. Oh, sorry. Before I do that, <laughs> let, me, let me start here because I think this is more important actually. This is the Lord's response to John. And I think it's relevant for us because we may overlook it, but I believe it's the same response he would have to us, for us. Go and tell John what you have seen and heard the blind regain their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the good news proclaimed to them, and blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. So I wish I had this in my pocket when I spoke to my Jewish rabbi friend. Because in a way, the messianic reign is here. We just don't know how to see it. Okay, so here's an opportunity for Josh Allen to see it.
you can't you can't draw that one up, write that one up any better. Um, and I, I was just told by Kevin Kern, it's been three years and three months. <sighs> it's my kickoff return, so pretty cool. It's what he's doing. He said he went around telling all the players, God is real. God is real. You know, Father Leo mentioned, stay hungry. And I remember that all the effects that I had of secularism, rationalism, and the rest, eventually led me to a low point in my life. And we know that it's on a low point that we're the hungriest. And it's when we're the hungriest that God feeds us. So that's how he developed a relationship with me as well. So I encountered the Lord right at that moment in my own life where the Lord spoke to me and he spoke to me, as Father Leo had mentioned the whole time, to the kerygma. It was the good news. Now I won't go into my witness story so much just because of time, but I could see that the Lord began to develop this relationship with me. Now. I want to shift focus for a second because what happened right after that initial relationship building, right? Sometimes we get needy in a sense, right? We get so used to God feeding us in such a way that we just kind of get complacent. We've all gone through this. And oftentimes we wonder, we kind of struggle in our lives because it's like, okay, was, there are certain points in my life where, man, it was, it was different. What happened? So the Lord challenged me to recognize that part of the relationship is to recognize that we need to be intentional. I mean, most of us here are married or have been married or will have had a relationship at some point in your life. You recognize at the beginning of the relationship you have what's called infatuation. But the fluctuation stage kind of dies out after a couple, some time. So then what happens? What happened to our love? Well, now it's time to be intentional. And that's what the Lord calls us to. So, another way, oh, I guess right into this, okay, is that it's good to remember, or it's good to look at the mystery of God because, you know, Father Leo talked about we need to be pro-choice in the Catholic version, okay? We need to be pro-choice. But I believe that God is also pro-choice. To illustrate this, so I've got a um, quote here from the Catechism. In God, power, essence, will, intellect, wisdom, and justice are all identical. Nothing, therefore, can be in God's power which cannot be in His just will or His wise intellect. God chooses. He, choose, he has chosen us. He chose me. He, chose, he chooses you. He chooses everyone, the world. Another way I'd like to illustrate this is from a reading that you may be familiar with. It's in the Old Testament. And it's a reading about Jacob. It says that that night, however, Jacob arose, took his two wives with the two maidservants and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he got them and brought them across the wadi and brought them over what belonged to him, Jacob was left there alone. Then a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When the men saw that he could not prevail over him, he struck Jacob's hip in its socket so that Jacob's socket was dislocated as he wrestled with him. The man then said, Let me go for his daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He answered, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall not, no longer be called Jacob, but Israel because you have contended with the divine and human beings and have prevailed. So the reason I share that is because we could either be, one, 
wrestling with God through resisting and through you know having doubt of faith and all these challenges or we could be wrestling with God to follow his way his path his will for us you got a choice now don't we just wish we can just ask the Lord, Lord, just show us the way. Just tell us, tell us how to do this. Right? Now, I think he does. I think he's on the way. But sometimes, just like Thomas, we could say, Thomas said, Master, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Do you remember what he responded? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. I think that is at the heart of our discipleship. Yes, we're going to learn the practical things. And actually, Jesus is very practical. I'll show you here right after this. But first, we've got to be in communion with him. We got to bring other people into communion with him. He is the way. Now, like I said, he's very practical. Now, I don't know if you recall, but we used to be called the people of the way before we were called Christians and Catholic. We were the people of the way. Jesus is the way. People of the way. We've kind of lost sight of that to some degree. But like I said, Jesus is very practical too. So he says, which one of you wishing to construct a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there's enough for its completion? Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish the work, the onlooker should laugh at him and say, this one began to build but did not have the resources to finish. Or what king marching into battle would not first sit down and decide whether with 10,000 troops he can successfully oppose another king advancing upon him with 20,000 troops. But if not, while he is still afar, he will send a delegation to ask for peace terms. In the same way, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Now the Lord, now he does challenge us to renounce our possessions. But I also believe that it's not just material possessions. It's an emotional possessions, mental possessions, spiritual possessions. What keeps us from following him, from joining him, being in communion with him?